most of us go through times, at some point in our life, we go through times of significant change. Um, times when the Lord gives us orders to engage in something different, uh, a new line of work, a new sphere of relationships, a new season of ministry. But much of our lifetime is actually just spent living out the orders that he's already given. And as we make our way to Hebrews 10 this morning, we're going to see that we have been given some specific marching orders, some specific things that we're to be about, things that we're responsible to follow. Um, I know that as we come to the book of Hebrews, I know on staff I'm kind of considered the Hebrews guy. Uh, I love the book of Hebrews. Um, there are certainly some re interpretive challenges that you have to face as you work through the book. Uh, and yet it's a glorious book that reminds us over and over that Jesus is better. He's better. And while there's debate again over how many groups maybe of people that are being talked to or addressed in the letter, we know that for sure one of those groups were, were people that had come out of Judaism uh, and had embraced Christ, had come to trust him and know him as their Lord and Savior. Um, they'd grown up in the traditions and the practices of Judaism um, but now they were, they were truly born again. They'd come to know Jesus as their promised Messiah. Um, but some of these believers were beginning to falter a bit. They were beginning to, to stumble a bit. As persecution of Christians uh, arose in the Roman Empire, uh, they, they felt that. They felt the weight of that. And some were wavering in their faith. Some were faltering in their faith. Some were bailing altogether, going back to that which was comfortable, going back to Judaism. And the writer wants to exhort them and encourage them not to do so. I would suspect here at North Creek Church, we have, I don't know, maybe a similar paradigm as from week to week, believers gather together to worship. Um, and, and yet I suspect that some of you are come and you're struggling, perhaps. You're struggling to make sense of the world. You're looking for something to hang on to, something to hold on to, to keep you going. Maybe the longing isn't to return to Judaism, it's just to return to something easier, something more familiar, something more comfortable. And, and there are no doubt those that are here this morning or that come from week to week, um, maybe coming for years. And you're here in the church, but you're not of the church. You're not actually part of the church. It's something that you do. It's not something that you are. It's not someone that you are. No matter where you are in your faith journey, the Word of God, I believe, has something to say to you this morning. And so it is that we turn our attention to Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 19 through 25 and follow along as I read. Here we find the writer saying, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's important to realize that at this point, literally kind of right here to a certain extent in the book of Hebrews, a, a shift takes place as the writer has been spending a lot of time building a doctrinal foundation for the fact that, that Jesus is better. Um, he is superior to all things. In the first six chapters, we see him being described as better than the prophets and better than angels, better than Moses and be better than Aaron. Um, he, he is portrayed as one who is superior in all respects. And in chapter 7, all the way up to this point in chapter 10, we, we see his priesthood described and explained, how, how it's of a better order. He's offered, a, 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 initiated a better covenant we see him ministering in a better sanctuary and offering a better sacrifice. The sacrificial system, as the Jews knew it, essentially died the day that Christ died on Calvary's mount. And in light of all that, the writer now calls for our response. 
the, the, the truth must be lived, and he's going to call us to a certain kind of action. Uh, the outline is really pretty simple. It's two parts. The, before giving us a series of marching orders, he essentially gives us the basis for those orders. What's the, what's the reason why we are to, to live the way he's going to call us to live? And that's gracious of the writer because we don't always get that in this life, do we? Sometimes we're told to do certain things and we don't know why. We don't know why we're called to do a certain thing. I know that uh, there were times in the Navy we were commanded to do certain things that I had no clue why we were supposed to do it. Couldn't understand it, didn't make any sense at all, and yet we were required, we were obligated to have to obey those things. That was our responsibility. Um, but boy, it sure makes it easier if you know the reason why you're doing those things. Uh, maybe something to think about with your kids when you're challenging them in certain ways or asking them to do certain things. Sometimes it's just more helpful to know the basis. And that's what the writer gives us in 19 through 21, the, the basis for the orders that we are to follow. Um, he begins with a therefore, and that essentially links all that has been said thus far with that which is to follow. It's designed to get the reader's attention. All the talk about the, the priestly order and the rituals and the covenants and the sacrifices and Melchizedek, all of those things was designed to show them something. It's designed to show us something, I believe. Namely, first, that we have confidence. We have confidence to enter the holy place. Confidence or boldness is, is a term that's regularly used in the book of Hebrews. And it's important to understand that this is not an attitude that the average Jewish man or woman would have possessed. They would not have had confidence. Only priests were allowed to enter the holy place, let alone the most holy place, the holy of holies. Others were strictly forbidden. And there were probably some that were still holding on to that notion. And the writer wants to remind them that through Christ, they had confident access to the Father. They could boldly enter the spiritual holy place and meet with the Father through Christ. And they needed that reminder. I mean, bear in mind, again, that this confidence is not a subjective attitude. It's not like we psych ourselves up for it, like uh, trying to win a game or something like that. No, it's not subjective. It's, it's an objective attitude. It's an objective reality. The freedom exists. It's a freedom to address a superior without fear of reprise, without fear of consequence or with apprehension. I know that when I was at my previous company and, and here at North Creek, I have certainly sought and tried to work with those that I know that, to, to have, that they can have the confidence to come to me with anything, anything that might be on their heart or mind. Number one, I've tried to make it um, possible because I've made myself accessible. And number two, hopefully, because I've earned their trust in the process. I've proven that I could be trusted. How much more so with God who is completely accessible because of Christ and can absolutely be trusted? He tells him that the chasm between a loving and holy God and sinful man was bridged by the cross of Christ. That access is possible, and God has proven over and over and over again that he can be trusted. And he's a God that can be trusted through Christ and his sacrifice. Through the shedding of his blood on our behalf, we have confident access to the Father. We need no intermediary. We have access to the Father. Christ has paved the way for us. And then the writer goes on to kind of describe that way. According to verse 20, he describes it as a new and living way. Um, that may seem like a fairly average description by all accounts, and yet it's really curious. The writer uses an interesting word choice for the word new. Kainos is the most popular Greek word that's used in the New Testament to describe either something that's new in kind or new in age. 44 times we see that in the New Testament. The word that's used here is only used once. It's only used right here in Hebrews chapter 10, and literally its original meaning was freshly slaughtered or freshly killed. You might think freshly killed, flesh, how does that co correlate to new? Well, maybe we'll see as we work our way through. You think about the priests of Israel. How often did they have to perform sacrifices to cover sins? They performed them daily. 
It was a daily ritual, day after day, week after week, year after year. But Christ's sacrifice was unique. Christ's sacrifice was, was fresh, in a sense. His sacrifice was a type that had never existed before, producing results that had never been experienced before. His was truly a new kind of sacrifice. Verse 20 says that, that the way is also unique for another reason. It's living. This is a favorite theme of the writer of Hebrews, one of many that he uh, refers to over and over. Uh, at least four times he refers to the living God. We sang in one of the lyrics the fact that, that Christ lives to make intercession for us. And of course, in chapter 4 and verse 12, we have a, a very familiar passage. The Word of God is what? Living and active. It's a living Word. That is to say, it has a vital power within itself and exerts that power over the soul. It has the ability to change a person. And in that way, that word is used in the same context here. So we have confident access by a freshly killed and innately powerful way. Again, seems a little bit hard to maybe wrap your head around until you consider the fascinating parallel that emerges. When you think about the fact that it's new, it's freshly killed, to a certain extent, we can say that that points to Christ's crucifixion to his death on our behalf. To call it a living way points to his resurrection, that he overcame that. In essence, the new and living way is the essence of the gospel. It's the essence of the message that we all are called to believe. Um, without this way, we would remain lost in our sins. But we've been given the very means of salvation. By the grace of God, we have eternal life through the freshly killed death of Christ and the living way, the resurrection of Christ um, that is applied to us through faith and by grace. This new and living way has brought us symbolically and, and positionally through the veil, through the curtain, to the most holy place where God is. When he talks about the tearing of Christ's flesh, it's a portrait of the tearing of the veil, the offering of his body that then secures for us the confident access that we've just been described previously. Yeah, we have confidence. It comes through a new and living way. And thirdly, he wants us to know in verse 21 that we have a great priest. This kind of like this little threefold uh, statement on, on the basis for the orders, we get one final assurance that's rooted in the person of Christ and his position. Many of these people lacked boldness. They lacked confidence. They were faltering. Um, and, and, and they wanted to turn to some, something tangible, maybe to someone tangible. You know, priests, while imperfect, had always provided some kind of support, some kind of sense in which a people's relationship with God was being cared for. Many people today, in fact, still turn to earthly priests. But verse 21 summarizes what has already been spoken. They and we already have a priest, a great priest like no other. In fact, if you were to just walk through the book of Hebrews, you would see mentioned over and over how he's described in chapter 2 and verse 17, our merciful and faithful high priest. In 414, he's our great high priest who passed through the heavens. 415. He's our high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. Chapter 5, verse 10, he's the priest according to the order of Melchizedek. That is to say, he is both priest and king. 620, he's our priest forever. 726, our holy, innocent, and undefiled high priest. In 8 1, he's our high priest seated at the right hand of the Father. And in 10, 11, and 12, he's both priest and sacrifice. We have a priest. We go to God through a priest. That priest's name is Jesus Christ. He has accomplished that for us. He has given us access, and his is a superior priesthood. Jewish priests could offer sacrifices to cover sins, but Jesus Christ, the great high priest, offered himself once for all time to completely cleanse us from sin, to wipe it all away. Though your sins were as scarlet, he washes you what? White as snow making us clean. And, and, and so it is on the basis of who Christ is 
and all that he's done that the word now calls us to action. These are, in a sense, the marching orders that we are being given. And verse 22 contains the first of them with a call to let us draw near. You know, no matter where you are in your Christian walk, um, that's always a good prayer to pray for anyone that they might draw near. I mean, whether I'm praying for someone who's wandered from the faith, I pray that God will draw them back near to the heart of God. Whether I'm praying for someone to come to faith, I pray that that God would draw them to faith, to an understanding of himself. And even for my own heart, the prayer is the same. We have need to draw near. We have need to stay close. We have need to be in his presence. And the Lord Jesus makes full and unabated access possible. And he kind of describes this this drawing near in four different ways in this particular verse. He says first that we're to do so with a sincere heart or a true heart. The original language kind of gives us an expanded understanding when it says that it's that which has not only the name and resemblance, but also the very nature corresponding to the name in every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name. In other words, our heart attitude should match what has been done in our hearts. Christ has cleansed us. He has given us a new heart, those that are in Christ, a new heart, a pure heart, a clean heart. And and, and our actions should reflect that, drawing near to him, desiring to be close to him, drawing near to him with, with sincerity, something that matches what it is that he's actually done in our heart. We must draw near with genuine sincerity, void of hypocrisy, void of our ulterior motive. That's the call that we're given to draw near in that way. Secondly, we're to draw near in full assurance of faith, in full assurance of faith, the same assurance that Abraham had when God had promised to give him a son. It means to be fully persuaded and without doubt. I mean, that is the essence of faith, right? The writer's going to go on in just a little bit in Hebrews chapter 11, talk about what faith is, um, that, that really it's the conviction or evidence of things not seen, the assurance of things that are hoped for. That's, that's what faith is. And then, of course, just a few verses after that, the writer will remind us that without that faith, without that full assurance of faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible So we're to draw near in faith, in full assurance of faith, recognizing that our hearts have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. It's the third thing that he mentions. The sprinkling of blood in the Old Testament sacrificial system only covered sins. Christ's sacrificial death on the cross allows our consciences to be thoroughly cleansed. 1 John 1, 9, probably a verse maybe you learned when you first became a believer. You know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. That's what his sacrifice does. Our hearts have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And then fourthly, our bodies washed with pure water. I don't know in this particular case if he's literally talking about literally being washed with water any more than the heart is literally sprinkled with blood. I think the symbolic language, while well, possibly a reference to the Levitical purification rite, likely stems from the promise in Ezekiel 36, where when talking about the new covenant and the blessings of the new covenant, God says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all filthiness. We rest in the promise of God. My friends, we, we are to draw near. We are to have sweet fellowship with the Father, approaching him without fear, without apprehension. We're to approach in full assurance of faith. And James reminds us that as we draw near to God, he does what? He draws near to us. He's promised to do so. Know this, if you you feel a distance between you and the Father, if you feel that there's something there, that there's something that's, um, you know, uh, you feel like prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. You're just, you're, you're not sensing that closeness. Know this, he is not the cause. He has promised to draw near. The son has said he would never leave us or forsake us. We have the Holy Spirit, a promise, who dwells within us. 
He will always be there. He is always faithful to his promise. The call is for us to draw near to him. We, we can't be, I don't believe, successful in the Christian life without this kind of dynamic relationship with the Father, a closeness with the Father so we understand his will and live out that will. I think as a church on the whole, we do well at that. But it's still a challenge. It's still a marching order we're being given. If you're out of the word, if you're not spending time in fellowship, if you're not engaged, maybe not even here, I'd encourage you, draw near to him by taking advantage of the things that he offers through his word and through his people. So may we heed this first marching order, draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Well, then he moves to a second one in verse 23, where the call is to hold fast. Um, holding fast, another common refrain in this great letter uh, 3.6, we're to hold fast our confidence, 3.14, hold fast the beginning of our assurance, 4.14, hold fast our confession, here again, hold fast the confession of our hope. He desires and pleads with his readers to hold fast, specifically to hold fast to the hope that's within him. He's not asking them to do something for the first time. He's not asking them to to make another such confession. He's exhorting them to cleave and to cling tenaciously. That's the picture of this holding fast, to cling tenaciously to the confession they've already made. Thoroughly possess it. Hold on to it. Um, you know, in the, in the movie The Patriot, uh, there's a scene near the end where Benjamin Martin is trying to set a trap for General Cornwallis, a mental trap in which he's hoping to use the general's pride against him. Um, everything was going marvelously according to plan when all of a sudden the militia's ranks, which that Martin was, was overseeing, they started to crumble. They started to break, and the British advanced, and the line started to falter. And in one of the film's defining moments, Martin grabs the flag, the American flag, and starts running back toward the British as people are going the opposite direction in retreat, and he runs forward, and he's yelling what? Anybody that's seen the movie, you might know what he yelled. Hold the line. Hold the line. He's compelling the troops to hold the line, stand firm, stand fast. And, and of course, what happens is they do. They rally behind their leader. They return to the fight, and they ultimately prevail. They ultimately succeed in that battle. Now, I have no idea whether that scene is historically accurate or not. I have no clue whether it actually happened. Um, but it serves well to illustrate the point. When, when, when things were at their worst... And retreat seemed like the only option for the soldiers at that point. The men rallied behind their leader, and they held fast. They held the ground. And we are called to do the same. You know, unfortunately, as with many illustrations, uh, there's a notable flaw in the one that I just used. Um, and, and, and it's one that rebukes me all the more, quite frankly. Because whether that happened or didn't happen, the way it's portrayed is that the, the men really had no idea whether they would prevail. The leader was calling them to something, but they had no idea whether it would actually be successful or they would just be killed. We, on the other hand, do know. They pledged their allegiance to Martin, hoping that they would succeed. We pledge our allegiance to Christ, knowing we will succeed. We know the end, and God wins, and we know that. And, and, and friends, we've sworn allegiance to him. And yet how often do we wilt when the pressure comes? How often do we falter? We know the outcome. We are called to hold fast the confession of our hope, a hope that is secure, a hope that is sure. We're guaranteed again to prevail. We can rest in that. We need to stand in that. And we're to do so, according to the verse, without wavering, without falling back, without retreating. Literally, the word kind of means no leaning, no bending. I, I, I don't break under the pressure. I wonder if you were to kind of ask yourself, and hopefully you do at times, you know, what is it that causes you to waver? What is it that causes you from time to time to, to bend? Is it the fear of man? What others think of you? Is it temptation, that besetting sin that you just can't seem 
to get a handle on. You just can't seem to resist. Maybe it's verbal attacks on your faith and the feeling that you just don't know how to defend it. So you don't. And you wilt. My friends, the word implores us, calls us to hold fast. Hold fast in those times. I mean, really, when you think about it, not to do so makes a mockery of the sacrifice of Christ. That victory that was obtained for us, secured for us, that gives us this future hope, we're acting as if there was no sacrifice at all, as if there is no hope when we cave, when we give in. Do we so quickly forget the surety of Christ's work both to save and to sanctify? Hebrews 6.19 talks about the hope that we have as an anchor of the soul, one that's both sure and steadfast. It holds us firm if we hold on to it. Friends, we need to hold fast without wavering. That's the call in verse 23. And then he supplies some additional motivation for holding fast in that same verse when he says that he is faithful. Boy, there's, there's probably no better reason to hang on to than knowing that he is faithful. I love what Matthew Henry says here about this particular verse. He said, God has made great and precious promises to believers, and he is a faithful God, true to his word. There is no falseness nor fickleness with him, and there should be none with us. His faithfulness should excite and encourage us to be faithful. We must depend more upon his promise to us than upon our promises to him. And we must plead with him the promise of grace sufficient. We must plead with him the promise of grace sufficient. I remember when I first came across that quote years ago, I was just so moved by that last phrase. God has promised us so many things. He's promised us eternal life. He's promised us the Holy Spirit. He's promised us his abiding peace, his enduring presence. And yet when it comes to holding fast, when it comes to to not bending, to not wavering, I'm not sure that there's any promise of God so dear and so practical as the promise of grace sufficient. Sufficient for every need. Where sin increases, grace does what? bounds all the more. Where there is weakness, power is perfected through all sufficient grace. May we plead the grace sufficient for our lives. Whenever, whatever enemy it is that you face, whatever it is that, that, that you regularly face, whether that be pride or lust or apathy or greed, whatever that might be, God has promised that the grace needed to face that temptation and to remain unbending, to remain unwavering, is yours in full measure. You have that. You have his promise. Because we deserve it? No, not in your life. Because he is faithful. Because that's his nature. And according to 1 Corinthians 10, how many temptations will we face in this life that have been, you know, absolutely unique to us and guaranteed to trip us up every time? How many? No temptation has taken us. Zero temptations, not one, and yet all too often we waver or falter. With Henry, let us plead the promise of grace sufficient. Again, not that he's unwilling to give. He is. I believe Henry's emphasis is on the lack of earnestness with which we ask. He is faithful. Grace is sufficient. May we plead to know more of that in those times when we need it most so that we hold fast. Friends, our marching orders were to draw near, we're to hold fast. Thirdly, he tells us here in verse 24 to let us consider. And I stopped there on purpose, even though you're probably thinking that I stopped short, that I maybe forgot the most important part of verse 24, how to stimulate or stir up one another to love and good deeds. The fact is the only verb in this particular clause, in this particular um, you know, verse is, is the word consider. It's the only action word actually in the verse to consider. And I know that in our everyday English, the way we use consider oftentimes can be, um, I don't know, almost like a throwaway word. Uh, we use it kind of loosely. It wasn't, it wasn't a bad week, all things considered. 
Or, uh, you know, I'm considering to head into the city today. Um, just something that, I don't know, we're, we're thinking about. Um, and yet, the, in the original language, it carries a much stronger emphasis. The, the emphasis is really to fix one's mind or to fix one's attention on something. One person described it as pondering aggressively, which I love that phrase, to ponder aggressively something. You see, while the result of the action is to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, the order itself is to consider, to actively engage our minds, our emotions, our wills in an activity that doesn't come naturally for most of us. We must decide to consider. We must make time to aggressively ponder. So what does that look like? Let me try to illustrate with another question. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but how many of you are prone to worry? You're prone to worry. You know that you are. If you know you are, you know who you are, okay? You're prone to worry. Um, if you're prone to worry, you know that there are circumstances and situations that at times absolutely consume your thinking. Like you don't want them to consume your thinking, but they do. They consume your thinking, and over and over you're rolling these things through your mind. Your mind just seems to work overtime. Can't seem to get it to shut off. So that might be a negative application of what he's saying here. That kind of fervor, that kind of energy, that kind of focus on a particular thing, that's what he's calling us to. Let us ponder aggressively to consider aggressively um, how to stimulate and how to stir one another up. That stimulating or stirring is simply an extension of, of, of thoughtful consideration. And what is it to stimulate one another, to stir one another up? Um, the word is literally can be translated incite, incite. And, and when you think of the word incite, you probably often think of like riots. That's what the riots get incited by people. Um, that's the negative use of the term. Um, here, it's not a negative action. It's actually a, a positive irritation, if you will, a positive inciting. We should be engaged in the activity of determining how to encourage, how to enable our brothers and sisters to live godly lives. We should be actively engaged in that process, even if it means getting in their kitchen a little bit. So let me ask you, as I've asked myself, after you've sought to draw near to God with a sincere heart, after you've pled for grace sufficient that you might hold fast, is this what occupies your thinking? How to stimulate others, how to encourage others to love and good deeds? Does this aggressive pondering characterize your life? And does it find expression in this way? I, I think it's safe to say that many here at North Creek are actively engaged in this and are doing that. I also think that for some, it's probably not even on the radar. And, and to that end, let me just quickly suggest what this stirring might look like. Three little practical applications, if you will, and how to kind of play this out. First, you know, if you're going to do this, you need to speak the truth in love. You need to speak the truth in love. Exhortations and admonitions ring hollow when the one receiving them does not believe they're being offered in love or with their best interest in mind. Those of you that knew Steve Severance, Julie Dresdo's dad, he probably exhibited this quality better than anyone I've ever known. People knew and respected him, knew that he loved and cared for them. So when he asked the hard questions, when he poked around a little bit trying to encourage and exhort, they knew it came from a place of love and concern for them. Speak the truth, but check your heart, check your motives. Secondly, I would say this, live the truth. You speak the truth to people, but boy, you better be living that truth. Exhortations and admonitions ring hollower still if the actions aren't currently be, being modeled by the one who's doing the exhorting. I mean, exhorting a brother not to fly off the handle so much doesn't mean much coming from someone who flies off the handle all the time. We need to be living what it is that we are asking people to live out. And, and then thirdly, I would just say this, be, be specific. When you're talking to people, when you're seeking to exhort people or encourage people, be specific about things. Um, I am significantly more likely to be stirred to loving good deeds and exhorted in, when exhorted in specific ways as opposed to general, broad ways. For example, if Kent were to tell me that he thought I needed to pray more, 
Jim, I think you should be praying more. It sort of leaves me stuck with coming up with a solution that heretofore has not worked because I'm obviously not praying enough already. But if he were to say to me, Jim, I, I know you spend at least 15 minutes driving into work every day. What if you put the, the missionary prayer booklet or what if you put the, the membership directory in your car and then not while driving, but while stopped at a traffic light or uh, you know, in traffic, uh, you take a glance at one of the names and pray for him. Okay, that's like a super specific exhortation that's tailor-made for my particular situation it's something that can be implemented and something I can be held accountable for. That's super helpful. But in order to come up with that suggestion, Kent had to know something about me. He had to know my circumstances. He had to spend some time thinking about what might work for me. He had to spend time pondering. He had to spend time considering how to go about doing that for me in my life. And while this verse, I think, is addressed to all believers, I would especially like to challenge those of us that are in leadership here at North Creek. May, may the Lord grant us this type of contemplation to stir others up as we watch over their souls, the souls that God has entrusted to us. May we be better at that. Drawing near, holding fast, considering. Finally, we, we get to this last uh, statement, which some see as just an expression of the the, the last one, let us consider, but I, I call it out separately, not forsaking, but encouraging. Not forsaking, but encouraging. We see that in verse 25. While the possibility exists, again, that that's just a way that we stimulate one another to love and good deeds, I, I see these two contrasting verbs setting apart against each other as, as worth noting separately. Not, they're, they're really contrasting actions. That, that I think are purposely set against each other, not forsaking, rather encouraging. You know, the issue of not forsaking the assembling together has, in my opinion, been misused by many over the years. Sometimes people look at this verse and kind of point to people that are sporadic in their church attendance. You know, they're just a little rough here and there. They, they show up every once in a while. Um, they get a little loose, and so we break out Hebrews 10.25 on them. Uh, some view this maybe kind of as a verse to use when they talk to people who says, I, I don't need to be in church to worship. Like, I don't have to be there physically to worship in church. And so we, we break out Hebrews 10, 25, and, and uh, hey, you know, you know, you need to be here. Don't forsake the assembly together. Um, some, some maybe use it kind of in the other direction, basically say, hey, if the church doors are open, you better be there. If the church is gathering, you better be there. You better be there for everything. Don't forsake. Um, I've heard all of these be used by various people at various times. And, but friends, I think we need to remember the context in which this was written. It was a time of, of persecution. Probably the letter was written maybe somewhere mid, mid-60s, mid early 60s, somewhere in thereabouts, uh, possibly earlier. But uh, certainly persecution was on the rise in the 60s. Nero would come to power. Um, and, and in this time of growing persecution, in this time of growing hardship, the writer exhorts them not to bail on the Lord and one another, which is precisely what some of them were doing. See, the word forsaking here is, is, is a Greek word which means to desert or to abandon, like to, to completely leave. 2 Timothy 4, Paul pleads with Timothy there to come to him soon, and the reason why is because Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. He's left. He's abandoned Paul. He's abandoned the faith for all we knew at that point. Same word, same concept. Some of these believers were caving. They were abandoning altogether. Fearful of persecution, immature in their faith. They were deserting the church and deserting their brethren. They were forsaking the assembling together with the gathered church. And seen in that light... It's really probably relevant for many parts of the world. Hard to see how that's completely relevant in our case. But we should take heed because the time may yet come when the church in America or the church in California, the church in Walnut Creek is faced with some decisions, forced to choose either to suffer with the children of God or to compromise to escape persecution. And in that time, the church, we who assemble together, may be the only practical solace we can find as brothers and sisters in Christ. If that time comes, when that time comes, it's not time to bail. It's not time to leave. It's time to encourage one another. 
parakaleo, to come alongside one another. It might take the form of exhorting some of those who are wavering or comforting some of those who, whose commitment to Christ is costing them something. Either way, that's the time we'll need each other most. We shouldn't bend, we shouldn't break, we shouldn't forsake. And the text leaves us with one final thought as to why that should be the case, one final motivation, and that is that the day is drawing near. There's some mixed opinions on what that day is, what the day is it's being referred to. Uh, some view it as the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I think most others would lean on the day of Christ's return to the earth. But both of them convey the same message, that judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Beloved, the word makes it clear that one day we shall all give an account. We shall all stand before Almighty God and give an account. It is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes the judgment, Hebrews 9 tells us. So what does that look like? Well, for us, for those of us that are in Christ, that you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, <coughs> for us, we will not stand condemned. We will stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We'll still give an account for the way in which we lived, but we will stand justified on account of Christ's work on our behalf. And this, these verses challenge us to live in light of that. Spurgeon says that too many think lightly of sin and therefore think lightly of the Savior. He who has stood before his God convicted and condemned with the rope about his neck is the man to weep for joy when he is pardoned and to live to the honor of the Redeemer by whose blood he has been cleansed. Oh, may we embrace these marching orders that we've been giving, drawing near, holding fast, considering and encouraging one another because of all that Christ has done for us. But I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that there are probably some here who remain convicted and condemned standing before God clothed only in your own good works, in your own righteousness, the perfectly loving but perfectly holy judge will pronounce a guilty verdict and cast you from his presence. But praise be to God. He's provided a new and living way, a new way to find life through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in John's gospel, Jesus states the glorious reality that all the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me will in no wise, I will in no wise cast out. I will certainly not cast him out. If you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, those are your marching orders. Today is the day of salvation. You come to Christ, repent of your sin, draw near to him. He has promised to draw near to you. Let's pray. Father, we um, are grateful for the truths that we find in your word. And um, as I'd mentioned early on, there's something for everyone here in this passage. We, we rest in the assurance of all that we have through Christ, those of us that have placed our trust in Christ, and, and yet you've called us to be about certain things, drawing near to you, holding fast our confession, Father, recognizing that we have a confidence, a, a, a sure entry and access to, to you through Christ. So help us to do that. Help us to live for you and to live for others by your grace and by your strength. And Father, if there are some here that, again, have been kind of maybe going through the motions, they've been here for a long time, they've been here for a short time, and, and, and boy, they, they maybe know some of this stuff, but, you know, Working harder doesn't earn them favor with you, God. Coming to you in hum humility and with a desire to cast themselves at your feet, Father, that's what you desire. And as they come, as they are drawn, you will draw near to them. Father, I pray that that might be the case. I pray that we as a church would always be marked by people that love God and love people and desire to see disciples made that they might worship you that they might walk in love with each other, that they might witness of your great name to the world. Father, help this church to that end. 
Help each of us individually. Help us collectively. Honor you through our lives. And we pray this through Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.